So we looked at John Locke, uh, who kind of founded the school of empiricism. And an important note to make about John Locke is that he wanted to avoid skepticism. He thought that the senses could be the building blocks of knowledge, but then we could reflect on them and infer things uh, that we could know with certainty. He wasn't uh, a skeptic himself. And he was essentially you know, confirming the laws of Newtonian physics uh, be because based on our sense impressions and watching things fall and measuring them, we could infer from that uh, things that aren't immediately sensed, like the law of gravity. Okay, we could start to recognize uh, order uh, in you know the world and learn about the world, um, but learn things that aren't given immediately to the senses, but we learn them via the senses. So enter David Hume, an empiricist who, as we'll see, drives us into deep skepticism. Okay, uh, he divides up the world a little bit differently than John Locke. John Locke has. Uh, primary qualities, which are those underlying uh, attributes of a, of a thing, of, you know, such as solidity. Uh, we learn about them by reflecting on secondary qualities, which are the sense impressions themselves. Uh, David Hume divides the world up in terms of, or divides our, our thoughts up in terms of impressions, which are lively, immediate uh, sense impressions. So we're all having impressions uh, right now, you know, you're watching the screen, you're hearing my voice, you're seeing my shirt, you're seeing the board, uh, and so on, and you're seeing the computer and what surrounds it. That's all happening immediately, and those are impressions. And there's no grounds on which to doubt uh, impressions. Uh, they are in the mind. Uh, they are occurring. Okay, uh, we might make mistakes uh, when we reflect on those impressions. Uh, but the impressions themselves are there and are indisputable. But we also have ideas, and uh, that is a recollection of impressions after the fact. Now, David Hume here makes uh, uh, a, a fairly uncontroversial point that uh, while our impressions are can't be doubted, and they're occurring, and they're in the mind, our ideas might be flawed. We might incorrectly Re rec recollect those impressions. So when I was in an introduction to psychology class, I had this great teacher and um, she had worked this all out with her friend who was a police officer. Um, and so in the middle of us sitting in class, her friend uh, comes barging into the class, yelling at her, takes a paper, you know, a, a supposedly a, a test that she'd given them, throws it at her, cusses at her, uh, and then storms out of the classroom. And all of us are, of course, shocked. Uh, but then, and the teacher looks shocked too. Uh, but then she gathers herself and says, okay, pull out a piece of paper and a pen and tell me, you know, everything you can about that person who just walked in, how tall they were, what color hair they had, uh, you know, what everything that you can. And sure enough, we all had different re recollections of it. We all remembered the person differently, sometimes remarkably differently. Uh, and that just points out that after the fact, we might recollect things in a, in a flawed way. Uh, so, you know, we, we are wrong about it. Uh, so David Hume argues that if we are to know anything, if we should be able to trace our ideas accurately back to immediate sense impressions. And David Hume has us then look at sort of common sense ideas that we have and challenges us. Can you trace this back to a sense impression? Uh, and so one example is cause and effect, okay? which you have to believe exists if you're going to believe in, in Newtonian physics. Okay, So cause and effect. We believe that th one thing causes another. But David Hume says, trace that back, that idea back to an impression. Well, let's take the example of the billiard table. Okay, So what we do uh, when we play pool is, you know, what we see is a cue uh, striking a ball, okay, which then moves 
which then touches another ball, which then causes that ball to move. Okay. Now, our mind understands this in terms of cause and effect. We think that the the uh, cue causes the cue, cue ball to strike the other ball, which causes that ball to move. But what do our senses tell us? They tell us that these things touch, this thing moves, these balls touch, and that ball moves. Okay? Our senses just tell us that things correlate, that things are, uh, one thing is happening after another. Okay? Uh, our senses do give us that information. But according to David Hume, our mind takes a bit of a leap to then say that one causes the other to move. After all, the phenomenon of cause and effect in and of itself, it has no color, it has no um, you know, texture, it has no taste. It doesn't present itself to our senses. Uh, what happens is we see um, one ball touching another and then that ball moving over and over and over again to the point where we expect uh, the balls to move the way we, you know, the way that they have in the past. And then we uh, attribute that to a causal relationship between each other. Okay. Uh, but David Hume would say that we have no knowledge of cause and effect because we don't trace cause and effect back to a sense experience itself. We just, when we trace it back, we just experience one thing happening after another but correlation does not imply causation okay so all we would need is some you know random moment okay where our cue ball hits the you know the cue ball is struck and then touches the other ball but that ball doesn't move okay if that were to happen it would suddenly cause us to doubt the causal relationship we inferred uh, between these balls, okay? And the only reason that we say that they're causally related is because we just haven't experienced that occurring yet, okay? This might, you know, sound kind of strange, but the idea is that uh, all we need is it, we're just waiting on one counterexample uh, to, um, you know, throw the whole causal theory on its head. And what this means is that when we think about the idea of cause and effect, we are using inductive reasoning. And if you remember, that reasoning is when a conclusion is probable given the evidence. Okay? And when you know something is probable, according to David Hume, you don't know it, okay? Because knowledge requires 100% certainty, not probability. So we don't actually know that two things are causally related. We don't know that anything is causally related to another uh, because our theory of cause and effect is based on probability. Uh, you know, we have a thousand cases of the cue ball touching the other ball and that ball then moving. We have a thousand cases built up, making it seem highly, highly, highly probable that one causes the other. Okay, but all you would need is one counterexample, and the whole theory falls apart. Okay, so uh, this you know beyond the cue ball, let's just consider uh, economics. Okay. I just recently read a book um, uh, where the author um, was making the case that uh, that um, the the stock market is incredibly, incredibly complex. There's so many moving parts that there is no way that you can predict what will happen with any degree of certainty. But economists treat their discipline as if it's a science, as if they are learning how to accurately and necessarily predict how the market uh, reacts. So what this uh, author was saying is that um, traders, uh, you know, they essentially the greatest traders, the ones who make the most money, they're incredibly lucky. 
they have a trading strategy that just happens to work for the market at that given time. And then what the trader will do is they'll start to think that they figured out the market. They've learned um, exactly how the market works and they've learned what the, the right trading strategy is. And so if they implement their trading strategy, they can't lose. But what happens in markets is that something that has never happened in history uh, before will suddenly happen. Uh, and it'll cause the market to shift in a way that nobody had predicted because they've never seen it uh, in the history of studying the market. And, and, and this happens uh, time and time again where uh, a trader who puts all, you know, is just so certain in their, their uh, method that they put, you know, everything into it, uh, that they suddenly go from being millionaires uh, to uh, being bankrupt uh, because the unexpected happened. And that's because they were operating as though they were working with deductive reasoning. Uh, that if they, uh, uh, you know, apply these uh, methodologies, they will necessarily make money uh, off the stock market. Uh, and they don't, uh, you know, anticipate the unexpected. Uh, the, the traders who survive are the ones who probably make a more modest amount, but, uh, you know, give some probability in their trading strategy for the unexpected. In other words, they, they recognize that they don't know with certainty how the market will react uh, and how the market will act. So David Hume, this is um, an argument in epistemology, knowledge. So he's essentially saying that uh, if, you know, it's not necessarily the case that there is no such thing as cause and effect. But we, it's so long as we can't trace the very concept of cause and effect back, to a sense impression, uh, then we can't know it with certainty. So we know it via probability. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Hume argues that when you leave, you know, uh, your office as a philosopher, you put on your coat of faith that the world operates according to cause and effect. So, you know, he wouldn't challenge anyone to test, it, you know, cause and effect out by walking out into the middle of a busy street. You know, you, you trust that things are causally related, uh, but you do so based on inductive reasoning, on probabilistic reasoning, not with any degree of certainty. Okay, uh, so, so David Hume does the same when contemplating the self, okay? Is there a self? Well, this is there. We're going to see some correlations here with Buddhism. When you look for the I, the ego, you know, the mic that underlies all change. What do you? What do your impressions give you? When I inspect my mind, I see ever-changing thoughts and emotions and moods. I don't actually experience directly uh, some kind of underlying self that is constant through all the change. Uh, it appears that the self is an idea, a concept that I've constructed uh, that I can't trace back to an immediate sense perception uh, or, or an immediate impression. The impression is the immediate experience. And I just see, well, right now I'm in a good mood. And this morning I was really tired and kind of grumpy. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's nothing, that's what my senses give me, you know, when I introspect about the mind. I never see some kind of ego, you know, I, I, for instance, you never be able to describe the self beyond describing your various mental states. Uh, but the self itself, it has no weight, it has no color, it has no, um, you know, uh, extension, you know, I can't measure it, um, because it, it just is uh, ever changing mental states. So for David Hume, it's not necessarily that there is no such thing as an underlying permanent self, but we have no knowledge of such a self. Uh, at best, we can say that there most likely is a self. Okay, so there's when we say that there's no self, he means that there's no knowledge of a self. And that's where, where empiricism brings us. It brings us to a skepticism 
um, because uh, we, you know, it's hard to trace back all our ideas to sense impressions.